Today we're going to be continuing our uh, series, A Summer's Journey, and I almost want to retitle this sermon, Good Things Take Time, because we're going to be talking about time a lot today, and I need to start off this sermon with something that might surprise you, because a couple weeks ago, I told you guys my love for buttered noodles and, and chicken, right, and how that's what I cooked, what I ate, um, and everything I did was butter noodles and chicken. And my parents go to church here. My mom kind of got pulled aside after church every, by a bunch of people right after that. And they were like, did you only feed your son buttered noodles and chicken growing up? And, and my mom fed me well growing up. I, this was adult Brandon that only made butter noodles and chicken. But that's going to contradict what I'm about to tell you guys. Uh, and it's that I love to cook. I love cooking. Um, and believe it or not, I love cooking more than butter noodles and chicken. Um, but our world, we live in an instant gratification world. We live in a world that doesn't understand the time and the effort needed to get something good. How really good things take time, and food is one of those things. Food is something that you have to devote time, effort, and love to to make it better than anyone else's, to make it really good, and really good things take time. And I had a professor in college. Uh, we were in a class of, called Spiritual Formations, and he told us in that class, he's, he said, preachers, but really Christians, but preachers specifically, they need to learn to cook. Because cooking is a great lesson on how good things take time, on how, how much effort it goes into making something better than what you can just take out of a box, put in the oven, or something like that. You need to learn not to, to grab something from someone else and learn to, to make it yourself with your own hands and how much better it it tastes when you do that. And the same thing is true with spirituality and with preaching. So what did I do? I went back to my dorm room and did nothing. Probably made butter noodles and chicken. I did not learn how to cook that day. Um, so I was catching up with this professor probably three years ago. Um, and, and I asked him. We're catching up. We're talking. He doesn't go here. He doesn't watch our live streams. He doesn't keep up with necessarily the work I'm doing personally, except what I tell him. And so I just asked him, I said, hey, I just, I just want to ask, in general, what advice could you give to a preacher or, or a pastor or someone to, to be better at their job? What's something you could tell them? And I love his consistency because he said, learn to make pasta. And I was like, all right. He got a little more specific, but I like it. So I leave that coffee shop uh, and, and I go home and I did nothing again because that's what we do, right? And, and he told me that probably three years ago, that I needed to learn to make pasta, because I would learn to appreciate the time it takes to make something so simple, so good. But I like store-bought pasta. It's easy. Store-bought pasta serves me. I can go in, I can grab a box, I can go home, and in 10 minutes, I have food. It's great. I love it. Making pasta takes time away from me. Store-bought pasta serves me. So I never really learned to make pasta. It's about four months ago. This is where my love for cooking comes in. I'm scrolling on Instagram. My For You page is pretty much homemade pasta. And so I'm like, all right, I got to try this. Uh, not because of what my professor said, but because, you know, Instagram told me to. So I, you guys know what I'm saying. Yeah, you're laughing because it's true. Uh, so I decided, hey, I'm going to learn how to make pasta. And pasta takes hours to make if done well. It's very simple. It's like flour, egg, oil, salt, uh, mixed in the proper proportions, and you got to get in there and, and knead it. I like kneading it by hand. It has a feel and, and, and a smell for when it's done correctly, and so you're kneading a very firm dough for like 10 minutes. You're getting nice and sweaty. You're putting a lot of work into it. you got to wrap it, let it rest for at least 30 minutes, but really two hours is what you want because when you poke it, it's got to have a nice bounce back to it, and and, and it has a look to it and a feel to it when it's ready to go. So then once you let it rest for two hours, you have to roll it all out, cut it. You can use a machine or by hand. Uh, and then you have to let it sit for another 15 minutes before you can cook it or dry it out to keep it long term. Pasta is very simple. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to put pasta together. I make all our pasta at home now because it tastes way better. It takes a long time, but just like my professor said, I learned good, good things take time. Homemade pasta tastes way better than store-bought pasta. And so now that's the way we do it. We learned that when we make pasta by hand and you roll it out and it's fresh, that that's the way it's supposed to taste. 
and it's supposed to be. I think a lot of us treat church the way I treated pasta years ago. We hear people tell us that if you want to make church great, you got to kind of get your hands dirty. You got to got to get in there. You got to need it a little bit. You got to get involved. You got to be present. But store-bought's way easier. Store-bought helps me live my life the way I want to. Helps me live it quickly. It serves me. Store-bought serves me. I run into a lot of Christians, not necessarily here, but sometimes here, who look for store-bought church. They look for a church that serves their needs, where they can come, sit, wait, hear, praise, go home and live their lives the way they want. We look for a church to be a place where we can come and get our fill and leave and be good. When we do that, we forget what it takes to make the church the way Jesus designed it. Though. The way Jesus designed the work is it, the church is it takes work. It takes action. It takes effort from a big group of people. And today, as we dive into Paul's missionary journeys, as we go through them in July, we're going to be in Acts 19 today, if you want to follow along in your Bibles or in the version app. And last week, Paul showed us how to talk to people who don't necessarily believe what we believe. We looked at all the different bubbles that we live in, and Paul showed us how much effort and time he put into communicating the gospel. And this week is going right in line with that. I'm actually going to reference last week a lot. So if you weren't here last week or weren't able to catch it, you can catch it on Spotify, YouTube, or maybe Apple Music. I don't know if it's on Apple Music because I don't use Apple Music. Apple Music is terrible. If you use Apple Music, delete it. Get Spotify. Your life will be better. Uh, And so... That's what I do when I miss a sermon, is I pick it up on Spotify. Uh, So (laughs) that's not what we're talking about today. I'm sorry. I just don't like Apple Music. Um, So we're going to be looking at the time and effort that we got to look at what the time and effort Paul put into communicating the gospel. And today we get to look at what that looks like over a long period of time. Because like we said last week, time is an interesting thing in Scripture. Sometimes we read a couple verses and we think it happens here and now, but in reality it happens over a big course of time. So chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Last week when we were reading, Paul was in Athens. This week he's in Ephesus. There was a bunch of stuff that happened in the middle, and we didn't talk about it. Uh, But here he goes through the interior to get to Ephesus. A lot of scholars like to talk about what that means. Uh, in, In general, it just means he didn't take the big trade route. He didn't go on the highway. He took the local route. You guys know the local route when you're going through Mandarin. Avoid 13. Avoid old St. Augustine. You'll get there faster. So, He arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And so what Paul's doing here is you have to remember, Jesus was not that far ago. So when he walks into a synagogue, he's trying to place, okay, is this Jew, John's baptism, or Jesus' baptism? He's trying to figure out what OS they're running. And so so Paul asks, "Um, what baptism did you receive? And they they said, John's baptism. He's like, okay, I know where they're at. And so Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. And I like to imagine that Paul gave a gospel account here, told them all about Jesus. Because the next verse says, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were 12 men in all, Paul entered, the, <clears throat> Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for about three months. Once again, this is another verse where we read it. And this is a three-month verse in time on a calendar. Spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So they didn't like what Paul was saying. They started tearing Paul down. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had day, discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years. Another two verses here that take two years. These two verses are two years long. So that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So like I said, we're talking about time a lot this week. And here we have at least two years and three months in 10 verses of scripture. Two years and three months of Paul's ministry. And that's why I say good things take time. Good things take time because oftentimes in our culture, we want something now. 
We live in the instant gratification, but discipleship, preaching, evangelism, these things take time. And Paul's having daily discussions for two whole years about it. And so I was curious. I go down rabbit holes. If you've met me, you know this. We will be talking about something, and a minute later, we will be very far away from that topic. Um, And so while I was writing this sermon, I went, huh, what's this hall of Tyrannus? And so I had to research it. I know we have a couple people in the room who have been to Ephesus before, so they might see this as familiar, but uh, I'm not a big pictures on the screen person, but I thought I'd throw it up there. That most scholars who have studied this area believe that this is where Paul was doing his preaching. So that's the hall of Tyrannus, um, and they were able to figure this out because of bookkeeping. They found all kinds of books in this building that they were able to translate, and they learned that this is where a philosopher who was very good at his job named Tyrannus did all of his teaching and whatever philosophers do. And in the logs of Tyrannus, we found, which is culturally appropriate, that this building was not used by him between the hours of 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. every day. So for what we're going to call five hours, I don't know if Paul was there all five hours or if he was only there for two, but we know it was free for five hours. So we're going to call it five. Uh, And so for five hours a day, Paul would preach and teach in this location. In this location, he reasoned with people for two years. And in all of our church studies and our books and on evangelism and things like that, it says that it takes anywhere from 7 to 19 invitations to Christianity for somebody to be willing to accept that type of invitation. Not not become a Christian, but just be willing to listen 7 to 19 times. And I look at a picture like this and I just wonder how many times Paul said something to a passerby and they kept walking and they didn't listen. Or how many times he was teaching in the court and someone overheard something because they were standing in the back of the room, but they weren't sure if they wanted to buy in. How many times do we say one thing to someone in our culture and they say nothing back or don't show interest and we just leave it there? Because we live in the instant gratification world, we don't spend two years preaching somewhere. We don't spend the time it takes to make something good. We say one thing one time and it doesn't stick. And like we talked about last week, oftentimes we say it without gentleness and without respect. So there is no chance for a second time, much less a seventh, eighth, ninth, or nineteenth. So Paul stood in that court every day, two years, introduced people, worked with people, discipled people, talked with people. Good things take time. And in verse 10, we see that Paul, through that ministry, reached all the Jews and Greeks in Asia, And the Asia that's referenced here is actually modern-day Asia Minor. But in that two-year span back then, Paul couldn't have traveled on foot and pulled every single Jew and Greek in himself and taught them about Jesus. He was participating in a ministry of multiplication, not a ministry of addition. He couldn't stand in the court of Tyrannus for five hours a day and travel the world at the same time. He taught people who went on to teach other people. The disciples he was making went out and made more disciples. The people listening to Paul, listening to Paul, went into action for the Christian gospel to reach entire regions, entire countries in two years' time. And I wonder what the American church would look like if we went into action for the gospel. Because unfortunately, the American church is a church that comes to hear something great, not to do something great. We come because we want to hear something good. We don't want to do something good because (laughs) that takes effort. That doesn't serve me. The American church comes to church. We worship, we praise, we do the things, and we meet with our friends. And Wow, that was uplifting. And we leave. Act like nothing happened. I love the devotion of those listening to Paul. Back then, those hours when Tyrannus' court was empty, 11 to 4, so it was a cultural free time. Cultural free time, it's when, you know, you would go to Costco. Don't forget the rotisserie chicken, right? You would pick up the things from Lowe's for the weekend project. You would get started on dinner. Back then, they worked in the morning and at night. It's too hot during the day. We're living that right now because uh, it's hot right now, guys. Um, and so this was a cultural free time. They would do it what they want during this time. And the people with Paul gave up their time. I'm not saying they gave up five hours a day every day because then they couldn't have gone on their life and spread the gospel. But they gave up some of their free time to sit and learn with Paul. And the American church struggles to give up an hour for worship and build itself up every week. 
Half the time, we can't even drag ourselves through the door. We watch online. Much less are we training in discipleship, reading scripture, devoting ourselves to the teachings of God. I've said it up here once and I'll say it again, but a regular church attender, somebody who would check a box on a survey that says, I go to church regularly, only 8% of those people will open their Bible this week. A regular church attender, somebody that would check a box on a survey that says, I go to church regularly, they only go to church 10 times a year. The average church attendee goes to church 10 times a year. And we walk around and we have the audacity to wonder why our country is turning away from God. We we sit here and question why stuff out there is going wrong when we can't even get in here correct. When we can't come in here and prioritize our own faith, prioritize our own church, prioritize our own religion. How on earth are we going to be able to bring people to it if we can't bring ourselves to it? Now, I want to make sure I'm being clear because that was a little harsh. But I want to make sure you're hearing the right thing. We live stream because it's important. There's people who can't come to church, whether it's physically, mentally, that they cannot be here. But they deserve to go to church. So we live stream so that we can connect with them, so that they can be involved in a church body. There's people who are traveling. They go on vacation. They have homes in other places that they they go and spend extended amounts of time at. Vacation is not bad. Going out and, and, and doing that, having another place, not bad. Uh, but they want to be a part of a church family. And so they want to stay connected. So we live stream so they can stay connected with us when they're not able to be connected with us. Our live stream is not an excuse not to come. It's not, ah, I was tired this morning. Let's catch the sermon real quick and then we can head to the beach, right? It's not... It's not an excuse not to be here. What I'm not saying is that Swiss Cove is turning away from God, quite the opposite. I think that's why our preaching team preaches messages like this. I think we're working very hard to be devoted to God in every way we can, and many of our people reflect that. What I am saying, a little, a little nicer, is that change on a big scale out there in our community behind, beyond these walls takes big change in here. Big change out there takes big change in here. A change of heart in somebody out there takes a change of heart in somebody in here. And I skipped part of our scripture today, and I think we need to return to it real quick. Paul asks a very important question in verse 3. What baptism did you receive? And they answered John's baptism, right? So Paul explains John's baptism was one of repentance, and waiting, and then I imagine he told them about Jesus, and, and, and they were immediately baptized into Christ. They needed to, I say, update their OS, because that's how, you know, we talk today. They needed the updated version. I want to ask the same question, but a little bit differently, and it's, what did your baptism mean? What did your baptism mean? The baptism of John was that of a future promise, a coming Messiah, and something better on the way. News of the Messiah had not reached them yet. They didn't know Jesus came lived, died, and rose. That hadn't reached these people yet. And there was a more important baptism because of that that they did not have. They needed to to connect with the Savior and the Savior's spirit. They had ended up joining a religion of preparation and did not know that a religion of action and empowerment had already begun. So they had joined a religion of preparation, not a religion of action and empowerment because they didn't know that the Savior had come yet. Many of us are still participating in the baptism of John. Now, I know and understand that we don't actually baptize people in the name of John. We believe in Jesus. But what I am saying is that the American church participates in a baptism of waiting. We hear. We like what we hear. We believe. We confess in lordship. And then we wait. We want what the baptism has to offer, We like the salvation. We like the forgiveness. We like everything the baptism offers us, but we don't want to offer anything in return. John's baptism was a baptism of waiting. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a baptism of action and empowerment. And I'm challenging you all today to help us become a church that multiplies, not adds. To be empowered and to take action. To be a church that wants to make a difference, to make big change out there. I love our staff. I think we do great work. I'm a little biased because I'm on it. But 
We can't do it all. We can't add every single person in St. John's County in Mandarin. We need multiplication, not addition. Big change. Out there takes big change in here. It takes a whole body. It takes a whole church embracing the mission. Not necessarily our mission. It's rooted in Scripture. It's rooted in what I'm about to say. But the mission of the gospel to introduce people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we can do it. It's, it, we can do it. We watched Paul do it in 10 verses today. He taught, encouraged daily for two years and reached an entire region. What can God do through Swiss Cove if we become a people of action instead of people of waiting? Because last week we looked at how Paul shared the gospel with unbelievers, how he was able to communicate to different bubbles and different groups of people, the effort he put into learning and educating himself to be able to give an incredible sermon. And I challenge you guys as a church to brush up on how to communicate with culture, how to communicate with different people. And this week, we're challenging you to go do it. To go do it. To step out into action, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and be willing to move. And if you need any help with that, having any of those conversations, I'll be right down here in a couple minutes. I would love to talk to you about that. You can find someone with a name tag, their staff or elder. You can email us, call us, text us. Our information's on Google. But we say it here all the time. Our mission is to glorify God and make disciples of the nations. We want to participate in a baptism of action and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We do not want to sit on the sidelines and wait and just take what religion has to offer us and give nothing else in return. Because when we become a Christian, when we're baptized into the Holy Spirit, we enter into a new story. A story that's much greater than any story I could ever write myself. A story that has more power, more authority, more conviction than anything we could ever do by ourselves. Because that story is the story of the Holy Spirit, the story of the God that created this entire world and wants a relationship with you and with me and with everybody else beyond these walls. Big change out there. It doesn't happen until big change happens in here, though. Each week we take a moment to remember why we do it. We talked about Jesus coming down, dying on the cross, living his life as a man. And that's why we come. We come to serve God. We come to be a part of a bigger story. And we take a moment each week at Swiss Cove to remember that moment. To remember why we do it. Why we come. Why we disciple. Why we read scripture. Why we pray. It's not because my friends are here. We want your friends to be here. We like more people. We like your friends. We hope you like your friends. We want your friends to be here. It's not because you had nothing else to do today. So I went to church. We are here. We go out and make disciples because Christ died for you and for me because he gave up his position with God to live life as a man, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, was buried in a grave, and then rose from the dead. That's why we meet here. Because the only thing that's going to matter 100 years from now is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we take this moment every week, this meal, with the bread and the juice, the bread representing God's body that was broken for us, and the juice that represents the blood that was spilled out to cover over our sins and forgive us. We take a moment to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us to restore this relationship. And last week we said this moment was a reset button. It's a reset button to make sure we get it right. Because if we can't get it right in here, we won't get it right out there. If we cannot get why we're here correct, you're never going to be able to communicate out there to people the correct thing. So we're hitting that reset button again to make sure we get it right on why we're here, on why we worship. Because Christ died for you and for me and for everyone else. Around the room, you'll find seven tables. In the bottom cup is the bread, and the top cups in the juice. You can get up and get your communion after we pray. Father, we thank you for this day and the ability to come and worship you, Lord. Help to empower us with your spirit, to fill us with your spirit, to become a church of action, of going out, knowing that good things take time, that it's not going to happen in the snap of a finger or going to happen in an instant, but it happens when we put time, effort, love, and passion into 
a relationship with you into church, into your body, into your kingdom. Help us to connect with you in this moment, to hit that reset button, and to remember that all that we do, we do because you came and died on the cross for our sins. In your name we pray. Amen.